Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival in September and artistic director of Doc NYC in November. On this episode, I talk to British director Tim Wardle about his documentary, Three Identical Strangers. The film looks at triplets, Bobby, Eddie, and David, who were separated at birth, then met each other accidentally at the age of 19 in 1980. Bobby remembers the discovery. Sometimes when you are just having a dream, now you know this can't be real. This can't be real. But you know there's nothing you can do to stop it, start it, change it. You just go with it. And that's what I was doing. I just wanted to see what was going to happen next. What happened next was the brothers became a media sensation. They appeared on television. Madonna cast them for a scene in Desperately Seeking Susan. They opened a Manhattan restaurant called Triplets. But their lives underwent many twists and turns that I won't spoil here. Newsday journalist Howard Schneider covered the triplets. He has this memory in the film. I think it was Eddie who said right at the beginning, I don't know if this will turn out to be great or terrible. So there was always a question mark, a big question mark about where the story eventually was going. Filmmaker Tim Wardle started this project while working at the London-based company Raw. They produced documentary TV series such as Locked Up and Gold Rush. Raw co-founder Bart Layton directed the feature documentary The Imposter that shares a stranger-than-fiction quality to three identical strangers. I spoke with Tim in March at the Miami Film Festival, where Three Identical Strangers played soon after its premiere at Sundance. Our conversation begins as Tim describes how he first learned about the triplets. So I was working as head of development, um, which is kind of like being that ideas guy. Uh, My job is to find ideas, pitch them to channels, broadcasters, funders. um, And sometimes people bring ideas into me and pitch them to me. And I have to kind of make a call on whether we're going to follow them up or not. And um, I've been doing that for quite quite a long time. Um, and I, you get quite jaded and quite kind of um, cynical about the stories you see. But when this one came across my desk, it was like, this is definitely the best documentary story I've ever heard. <laughs> and it, 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 it takes a lot, you know, when you're in documentaries, it takes a lot to kind of uh, surprise you. And this really did. And instantly I was like, we have to do this film, and I want to direct this. And and what was it that was presented to you? In what form was the story coming to you? So the story was brought in by a young producer called Grace Hughes Hallett, and it was just a very, uh, uh, just a sketch of, of the story, um, the triplet story. She'd previously worked on a documentary about adoption, and, and she'd read something about the triplet story in a, in a book, I think, and, yeah, just brought, brought in a kind of bare bones um, outline sketch of the story. And so there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to cover in this conversation because I want audiences to discover it from themselves in the film. But I'm not giving anything away to say that at the time that uh, the triplets discovered each other, it was a big news story. They were on the front page of New York tabloids. They were on the Phil Donahue show and you know, probably multiple other shows uh, many of which you show uh, snippets of in, in the film. So I I wonder, to, you know, to the extent that these people had been in the media and had different versions of their story told before, what was their reaction when you stepped forward and wanted to tell a new version of it? I think initially um, the brothers were very suspicious of our intentions and quite cynical to be honest i mean um when you when you hear well, just that, listen to your accent uh, you know. well absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um uh no they they they'd been promised a lot in the past by various media outlets um and also if you you know if you when you watch the film and you see the the wider story of, of what's happened to them over their lives it's not surprising that they have issues trusting people Um, And the film spent four years in development when we were trying to raise the funds. And actually, that was pretty essential, I think, to uh, to, to winning, winning them over and and earning their trust. And and to be honest, I don't think we had it until the very end, until we showed them the film. And 
so the the film was in production for five years. You just described four years in development. Was was, those, was that four years really just trying to get the money for it? It was a combination of trying to get the money and trying to um, make sure that they were completely on board and that the kind of ancillary cast of characters were were on board as well. It was it was incredibly frustrating. I was kind of doing my day job. Uh, and, and trying to keep this project going on on the side. And we spent a long time trying to get funding in the UK and, and a lot of parties were very interested and then right at the last minute kind of pulled out for a variety of reasons. Um, and luckily uh, Sundance came in with a small amount of money that allowed uh, me and Grace uh, to go and film a taster tape of the, just a, a day, you know, filming the guys talking about their story. Mm-hmm. Uh, we cut that. Is that t- something we see in the film? Uh, no, no, n- okay. none of that's in the film. Actually, there's a little bit of one of the aunts in the film, but uh, the, the aunt in the film. But no, it's it, you know we reshot everything, and um, so we cut this this little taster together and took it to the US, and instantly, you know, everyone we mentioned showed it to was just desperate for the story. So uh, maybe we should have gone straight to the US in the first place. But I think because my background is the UK and that's what I know the documentaries world in England, I. I kind of tried there as a, as a first port of call. Uh-huh. So uh, you said that this was your first feature-length directorial effort. What was your directing experience before? I directed um, a number of documentaries for the UK for Channel 4, which is a, a broadcaster in the UK. Um, much more kind of verite films, I suppose. Uh, you know, I did a film where I spent seven months inside Europe's biggest prison for com- convicted murderers, uh, just, you know, literally given a set of keys and wandering around with a camera, um, <laughs> which was a pretty intense experience. So uh, my background was more in that tradition, the UK tradition of kind of verite uh, actuality documentary. Uh, and so this was a new departure. You knew from the beginning that you were going to have to take a different approach to this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the reasons that I, I'd gone to Raw in the first place was I was really interested in what they did with the imposter and, and how they use um, techniques and structures from, from narrative films to uh, inform documentary. And I, I was really interested in learning that because I, I, you know, everything I'd known up until that point was much more verite and much more less. There's a real skill to doing that kind of past tense storytelling and doing it well, and Raw are the experts at it. In Three Identical Strangers, Tim's interviews bring out vivid memories. Here is the aunt of one of the triplets, Hetty Page. The first time that the boys met together, the three together, was at my house. And the three of them ended up like puppies wrestling on the floor. It was the most incredible. It was the most incredible thing. They belonged to each other. They knew each other. There was no formal introduction. I mean, when you meet somebody for the first time, you don't end up rolling around on the floor with them. I asked him how he got his subjects into a mode of storytelling that feels so in the moment. It was my main fear that these guys had told their story so many times, like, how am I going to get it fresh? Um, and I, I tried a variety of techniques. Um, you know, I sat them down before the first interview and said, you know, imagine you're at a bar sharing stories with someone and someone says, you know, I've heard the greatest story ever and they're, they're telling their story. And then you, you're like, I know I've got that beat. And you, you've got to tell this as if you're telling it for the first time to really impress someone. Um, you know, I don't want you to embellish but I want you to try and transport yourself back to what it was like in that in that moment. Um, and as a director, what you're looking for in documentaries is emotional honesty. That's what I look for above anything else. Um, you know that the, the, that sense of real feeling, be it you know joy, anger, sadness, whatever. That's that's what you're trying to tap into, or that's what what I believe docu- makes great documentaries. And I was really fortunate that they kind of brought it, you know. I, I I don't know how much of it was my skill and how much of it was just their great contributors, but they were able to tap back into those feelings from the past and, and relay them as if it was the first time you were hearing them. Was there anything else you were doing, like pulling out old photos or news clippings to try to put them back in that moment, or was it, was it all their own effort to get back in that moment? 
Not so much. I mean, I think it's a lot about how you phrase the questions and how you approach um, people. You know, you you know, going into those interviews, there's certain details you want to get. But it's a huge mistake, in my opinion, to be very prescriptive and be like, say this, say that. You know, I would never do that. So you kind of it's a it's a weird combination of having having done a lot of prep and knowing exactly where you, you kind of want the story to go, but also being open to their mood, their emotion and, and their story. And, you know, like Bobby, who's one of the main characters, uh, brought up this whole riff about his car and how he was driving this car that was a piece of junk and um, that suddenly became the opening of the movie and actually becomes later when the boys meet each other this kind of really interesting signifier comparison of you know how well they've done in these different families you know what what car they're driving is the kind of status symbol um, so so a, a lot of it came from them um, you have I, think, to I think that's a good example because not everyone would give up that detail. Yeah, and and look, you you have to have a lot of time to do these interviews, and you know we had pr- pretty much you know a day uh, with with them, and then we went back and did another day later. Um, so and- what what is that like when, when you take a day to interview uh, someone? Inevitably, as the day progresses, you know people's energy changes. Maybe it gets stronger, or or maybe they get tired. To- it's a very good question. I actually had them on a really uncomfortable chair, a metal <laughs> chair, and uh, the sound recorders kept saying to me, you know, oh, they're, they're looking really uncomfortable. Do you want to, you know, we can get them a cushion chair. And I was like, no, 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 leave them, leave them on there. <laughs> and uh, I felt really guilty, actually, at the end. One of them uh, told me that he had a really bad back that I hadn't known about. So I felt quite bad about that. But, it, uh, you know, just simple things like that. And, you know, taking breaks when they're needed. Um, and uh, naturally, energy levels do drop, like post having a lunch and that kind of thing. And you, sometimes you just take it back to an element of the story that you know they feel comfortable or particularly emotional with. Even if you're not p- intending to use that, you know that that gets them in a frame of mind again where they're excited and, you know, emotional or emotionally honest. Um, and, and then that enables you to then pick up the story again from 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 where you are. I, it sounds very cynical and planned. I, there's a lot of in- intuition that goes into it. All I would say is that prepping having having doing a lot of prep beforehand and then but then being open to the person you're communicating with is 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 really important hmm. so you described that the process of winning trust was an ongoing one and and even when you're doing the interviews they perhaps had to, you know still a certain amount of skepticism about the process before you got them to sit down and uh, and tell these stories what were the techniques you were using to to win them over? Is, is that about face to face meetings or sharing other work you've done? Or it, it's both of those things. I mean, I think you can't beat time on the ground with people. Um, and and the producer of the film, Becky Reed, did an amazing job. Um, you know, going out to the the US, meeting them. It, it was tricky because obviously we're based in the UK. There's only so much you can do on the phone. You know, you need to see people and sit there and talk to them. And the, you we had to win over these three fam, you know, quite disparate families that they they'd grown up in um, and their partners. Uh, she did an incredible job, kind of um, earning people's trust and and just you know sitting and talking. That's that's all you can do. I think also I sent them. Uh, a couple of films that I'd done um, and I, I never thought they'd watch them and then quite late in the process Bobby said to me oh I really like that one documentary you did about I did a documentary about one punch cases where it looks at the repercussions of a single act of violence and you know where someone killed someone by accident um, with it, by throwing a punch and um, so I think it all it all kind of adds up and also just being relentless and not going away you know a lot of um, the way the media works now is people will phone you up and ask you to do something you know and, and, and bombard you with requests and then they'll go away and we just didn't we just kept we just kept at it for a long time so in the course of this film there's as you said a lot of twists and turns to uh, the story there's some things that I think you uncovered in the process of uh, of making the film and I wonder how much you understood what the arc of the story was going to be when you started i had some basic thoughts about where i thought the story might go but the truth is we we really had no idea we knew up to about the halfway point you know we knew the backstory of these guys we knew the story of the reunion and we knew the first kind of major twist 
But beyond that, we didn't know where it was going to go. And we and, and the whole way through, you know, even it, we got some footage uh, in the on the last day of the edit that we kind of put in. So things were changing the whole way through. Um, and uh, you know, I think that's the best way to make documentaries. You know, as that fa- famous expression, if you if you end up with the same film you you started out to make, you haven't made it, you haven't done it right. You know, and I really believe in that. I, this was an unusual film in that it it's a combination of this past tense storytelling with the you know recon and archive, and then present day verite. And to me, they, those are completely different documentary forms. I mean, as as different as in the in the drama sphere, you know, a, a horror film and a um, romantic comedy say I mean they're almost different genres and getting the two of them to fit together was a huge challenge and something I really worried about um, we have this kind of key moment in the film where one of the guys in interview you know in a sit down formal sit down interview stands up and walks out and it's quite long And uh, but it, we had that on purpose to kind of act as a, a space of kind of decompression between the two genres or two types of filmmaking that were in there because Otherwise, they don't fit together that well. They're very tonally and, and, and different and very different in terms of pace. It was interesting watching the film here in Miami yesterday and hearing audience comments about it afterwards. And uh, I think any audience member, myself included, has different interpretations of characters in the film. I mean, you know, there's characters in the film who operate out of best intentions, but you, uh, you might second guess them uh, with hindsight. And... And I think there's characters in the film that one audience member might judge harshly and uh, the person sitting next to them might be more generous. I wonder how much you were conscious of that as you were putting the film together, that, you know, that there would be people in here who are polarizing. Absolutely, I was aware of that. I mean, I think what, what interests me is the kind of nuance of human behavior. I'm not interested in films, documentaries or other films that kind of posit um, – black or white kind of um, binary uh, positions in terms of characters' morality. I'm much more interested in the kind of gray areas of human morality. And if you look at the previous films I've done, I guess that's a c- consistent thing. You know, like the the One Punch film that I talked about, where, uh, you know, what does it mean to kill someone by accident and what are the implications for you and everyone around you? Um, it's similar with this. I think that um, very con- I was very conscious as I was making the film that people might react in certain ways and I but I'm pleased that it seems to have divided people the reaction to certain characters that's what I was hoping for you know I uh, the gray area and the nuance in human um, behavior is what makes it so fascinating well it's also true of probably almost any documentary that if you spend enough time with someone you could cut together a piece that makes them look horrible, or you could cut together a piece that makes them look heroic. Um, and, you know, and I wonder how you thought through those choices in, uh, in, in this film. It's a huge responsibility um, telling people's stories and, and, you know, the amount of power you have as a documentary uh, director is, is enormous. And the re- repercussions for people, if you get wrong, that uh, representation are, are, are are major I mean all I would say is that you you need to be honest with your contributors Uh, you call them subjects in the US I prefer contributors particularly Mm -hmm. on this particular film and um, you have to be honest with people and say this is going to be my interpretation of your story it's not the definitive interpretation it's my my um, my version of it I will be true to how I perceive your story and how I perceive you Um, but I I'm not presenting a definitive portrait. I hope you like what I do, but you know I've I've got to be true to myself in terms of how I represent things. Um, but it is an enormous responsibility, you know. And I was talking with a filmmaker here. There's a central irony or hypocrisy in documentary filmmaking in that very very few documentary makers would ever let anyone make a film about them. Right. And, and and I think it's important to embrace that. Um, uh, hypocrisy, paradox, whatever it is, as a director, and be aware of that, you know, and and rather than pretend it doesn't exist, which I think a lot of filmmakers do, and put it to the back of their head. You know, I, I, I think about that every day. You know, I think if 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 someone was making this film about me, you know, how would I want to be treated? Uh, in the course of making this film, do you think that the people who are in the film 
had expectations for what it was going to be, or do, or do you think they felt a little jaded about it since that they had people come and go from their lives before? I think there was a combination of being jaded and curious about what we were going to do. Um, for me, the most satisfying part of the whole process was showing them the film, um, the central contributors, not because they liked it, which they did, they loved it, which was great. It was more, there was a weird emotion in the room and it it was this sense that we delivered on what we promised to do. And I don't think that's happened a lot in their lives. And that that was, that there was a real, it was really emotional, not because they liked the film, but because we'd done what we said we would do and, and, you know, deliver this, this project that told their story. So one of the uh, stylistic tools you use in, in telling th- the story is to use visual recreations for certain moments as uh, as a character is, for instance, telling a story about going back to school in the early 80s. You have some you know, visual representations of actors kind of acting out what, uh, what he's describing. And th- uh, that kind of recreation in a film can go wrong in uh, a thousand different ways. Uh, I'd love to hear what your feelings were about approaching that as a technique. I was initially quite resistant to the idea of using reconstruction, uh, partially for the reason you you mentioned that it can um, easily go wrong. It's also expensive. Uh, It's sort of out of vogue, I would say, at the moment, certainly in the feature doc world. Um, You know, it feels like those kind of classic Errol Morris documentaries and uh, films which, you you know, Man on Wire, uh, you know, it's we're, we're way away from that. But um, we looked at telling the story with no reconstruction, but the early part of the story, which which is the story of how these brothers discovered themselves, there isn't much uh, archive at all, either photos or, or film or anything. So w- if you wanted to tell that story properly and really uh, give it the t- screen time that it deserves, you kind of needed to um, have some images and... Um, you know, on a on a sort of childish level, you know, I I love drama films, and I always you know wanted to kind of unleash my inner drama director. So it kind of gave me an opportunity to kind of do that. Um, and was that your first time doing it? I'd done a little bit on on previous documentaries that, and and you know, the DP I work with, um, he's really rare in that he can shoot verite really well, and he can do those the interviews. And contributors like him. He's not a dry technical person, but he can also shoot reconstruction really well and he's done a lot of it so he knows how to do it impressionistically you know the key thing is as he says to avoid the kind of uh, mid shot the horrible mid shot where you can kind of see everything and you can kind of see um, people acting and you know that's not what you're trying to do you're trying to give an impressionistic sense of what happened at the time and he's great at doing that well I feel like it's an extra challenge in this film because you're constantly cutting back and forth to uh, to footage of the actual characters, uh, to, to archival sources. So, you know, if you don't have a hairstyle right or if you don't have if the general frame of, of a character right, you'd notice it right away. Yeah, get, getting the details right, I think, is really, really important. Um, th- those are the and things also, like, you notice. You're, you're recreating a Jufro that, like, doesn't even <laughs> exist anymore in, in the 21st century. Yeah, the, the, the haircut did, did worry me a lot. Um, we spent a long time trying to get the right wig for that. Um, the, 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 that kind of verisimilitude, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the details of the time are really important. You don't want to go kind of crazy and spend all your budget on all these kind of tiny details that people won't notice. But, you know, you need enough right that people will 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 kind of um, will go with it so there's uh, a big philosophical question that this film raises and that the lives of these characters raise because they were three brothers who were raised by three different families um, and and that is a question of what role does nurture versus nature uh, play in a in a person's life and I wonder how you thought about that question, if you had given much thought to that question before you started making this film and how your thoughts have moved ahead while you're making it. So I'd done psychology at university and I had thought a bit about it then, but but it hadn't really troubled me for quite a long time. Um, making this film, I think I started off very much from a, from a nurture perspective. Um, you know, I think we all like to believe that we have a degree of control over our lives and the lives of our children. 
but making the film, uh, you know, I started to realize just how powerful biology is. You know, when these guys meet, these these three brothers, that there are unbelievable similarities between them, even though they've grown up completely separately. And some of them are very superficial and, and exaggerated by the media, but there are definitely some there and you know it would get down to the interviews you know these the, the 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 triplets when we were filming weren't really talking to each other that much and we we set up an interview to film the two of them together uh, and the two brothers turned up to the interview wearing the same shoes i mean <laughs> literally the same shoes and there'd be no prior conversation about that so there are these unbelievable things that happen that make you think wow genetics and biology are a, a huge part of who we are and our behavior and I think that that, that that question is still with me. It's not like the film definitively answers it. There's a, there's a lot of information there, um, but it's down to audiences to make up their own minds. So we're speaking in March. The film just had its world premiere less than two months ago at, uh, at Sundance, and the the contributors of the film came out for uh, for those screenings and and got to experience audience reactions to it. What was that like? It was incredible seeing uh, how audiences responded to the film and to them. Um, I think I was quite nervous uh, about bringing them out. They haven't had the greatest relationship over recent years. It's very much an up and down um, relationship. Um, but they said that the process of making the film um, had, have, has brought them together. And they, they said this at Sundance. They hadn't told me prior to that. <laughs> they told audiences that, which was amazing, you know, and, and one of the things I'm kind of proudest about about the film. Um, audiences really warmed to them and their story and kind of embraced them. And I think it meant a lot to them because they've kind of been, they were this big news story that's kind of been forgotten about. And yeah. It, it reinforces the fact that films that get made about people, that is part of their life, is having a film made. Um, and a person's life isn't the same afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it's slightly different with these guys in that they had their moment in the media spotlight, which went on for quite a long time in the 80s, and they were, you know, this viral, as one of the, one of the contributors said, this was viral even then. You know, they were huge. Before for, viral. <laughs> before, before viral existed. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things, actually, about this story is it's part of a pool of ever-diminishing stories that exist in that kind of pre-internet age where, where all the main contributors are still pretty much alive um, but it's before the internet has kind of um, spoilt it and, and reproduced the story a million times so that everyone kind of knows about it and I do feel that there's a kind of diminishing pool of those stories those kind of you know the man on wires and the um, touching the void kind of type mm -hmm. stories I'm interested to hear you say that about the potentially diminishing uh, pool of stories because sometimes I think the opposite when I uh, see a film like Three Identical Strangers, it it makes me feel like, well, here's a story that was once in the spotlight and there's so much more, it's, it's so much more interesting to revisit that kind of story. That's true. I mean, there, there, are, um, there are a load of stories that were portrayed in one way in the past. And Man and Wire would be a, a similar uh, one. You, I mean, it, someone might say, like, well, why w are you wanting to tell this story about Philippe Petit? Like, everyone knows that story. Uh, I think that's true. I think there is there is um, scope in reevaluating the kind of news stories, media events from the past. Um, I suppose it's just that I, having worked in development, I see a huge number of ideas, um, a lot that are kind of recent history stories. And you tend to see the same the same stories pitched again and again and again. And it's rare to get one like this that's so different that it stands out. I mean, I would say in 20 years doing development for various companies, including the BBC, th this stood out head and shoulders above the others in terms of both being a human story but being layered and having all these twists and turns in it. I mean, I think one of the things that really attracted me to it was the fact on one level that it was always going to be a film about storytelling, you know, it's about and and, and I love storytelling, I always have in any medium um, and uh, the twists were just so extraordinary and, and, the, and the layering of the, I think that's the other thing that's important, you know, you can have a great story with great characters but if it has no um, subtext or the thematic uh, underpinning then it's kind of just a superficial kind of story and because this has the nature-nurture 
aspect to it it's it, it's universal it isn't just the story of these guys it's the story of all of us you know they through their story we're learning something about ourselves and that's quite rare and um really uh really gives you something to seek, sink your teeth into as a d- director so how does it make you feel about whatever you do next? You know, I, I think I've reconciled myself to the fact that I'm not going to find a human story quite as remarkable as this, possibly in my entire career. Um, you know, my editor on the first week we were looking at the material, he said, we are never going to work on a story like this ever again. I want to thank Tim Wardle for speaking with me. His film, Three Identical Strangers, is now in theaters released by Neon. The film was funded by CNN. Thanks to our team, series producer Sarah Modo, our Miami-based sound recordist Khalil Bailey, sound mixer Tom Micah, and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. I want to invite you to listen to our short-form podcast, Documentary of the Week from WNYC. You'll find over 160 documentary recommendations. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.